Thank you, Lord. We just want to give it all to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Well, we got you up on Ustream. Now we'll get you up on KAZ. We got about uh, five minutes till showtime. Five minutes till showtime. Praise the Lord. Let's see what we got here. Five minutes till showtime. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Five minutes till showtime. All right, four minutes till showtime now. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You are worthy. Four minutes till showtime. Four minutes till showtime. This is amazing. Bless you, Pastor. Bless you. That your phone? Mm mm. Oh. Yeah, I put them on vibrate just in case. Three minutes till showtime. Three minutes till showtime. Two minutes till show time. Two minutes till show time. All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen and amen. Boy, I tell you, he helps me out every time. Right down to the wire. <laughs> amen. amen. Right down to the wire. It's raining, huh? Is that what that is? It pops. Oh, yeah. It's pouring. It started when I got here. Really? Mm -hmm. And of course I got my car washed. <laughs> of course. Yeah, it's always time. It's always time to rain when I got my car washed. <laughs> Praise the Lord, hallelujah. You are tuned in to KAZ Radio, Cleveland's online inspiration station. And today, I have a special guest in the studio with me, none other than Dr. Reverend <laughs> Anthony, you know, I got to go through all that, <laughs> Anthony Matta Jr. How you doing, sir? I am blessed. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for being on KAZ, man. It is a blessing. Uh, you know, we, we reached out to you, and you, you graciously accepted our invitation, and we thank you so very for much for that. We're honored to have you here today. And to start off the show, okay, my audience likes to know, well, they know you're saved, <laughs> but they want to know your testimony. Okay. How did you come to Jesus Christ? Well, uh, I call myself a church kid. I've been in church uh, my entire life. Uh, I got saved at Freedom Christian Assembly under uh, Apostle Richard Bunkley. Uh, started oh, yeah. out in every area of the church you could think of, ushering in the choir, doing things behind the scenes, children's church, and uh, just the impact from that, from my parents and me being around that environment. Uh, I actually never kind of walked the aisle like a lot of folks did. I had an encounter during praise and worship one Sunday. I was 13 years old and I made a decision that, you know, it was time for me at that point to really just accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I had done it before, okay. but uh, there was something that has happened in that service when I hit 13. No, and I 13 said, years old? 13 years old, and wow. I said, I, I need to do this. Wow. And uh, that's when things began to shift. So, so wait a minute, wait a minute. 
<laughs> I, mean, I mean, at thirteen, you got saved, and, and 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 I mean, what was I mean, what was it that what was that unction? What was the 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 thing? Had you been acting bad last week and decided to get saved? <laughs> this week? I mean, really? I mean, what was it that what unctioned you to do that? Well, we actually started out a Christian fellowship center. Okay. And uh, I was a little bit younger, and uh, when Apostle Bunkley started his ministry, we shifted over with him and uh, helped him open his church there. And just you say we, your, your, your my, family? My parents, yeah, my parents. family, okay. yeah, Matt Oxes, and uh, we came in there, and there was just something about that environment. I had seen it, I had seen the life-changing testimonies in other folks' lives, and just being a young child in worship, you see the experiences that people have, and I said, I want that. I want yes. to know what it's like to run into the building and have an encounter with God. It just totally changes whatever's happening in your life. Amen. And I remember in this particular worship service, just seeing people with their hands lifted and tears all over the place, and I said, God, that's what I want for my life. Whatever they're getting from you, I want that for the rest of my life. And Amen. so that's when I made the decision then to say, what, what, what must I do to be saved? I, so, I to do that. So now, is your parents also uh, pastors and ministers? So uh, they're elders in my church. Uh, elders in your church. Yeah, my mother's been teaching children's church forever. She started at Christian uh, Fellowship Center off Lakeshore. And uh, she's been dealing in the children's ministry for some time, and my dad's been in evangelism, so that's what he's uh, he's running at my church as well. Okay. My mother's over our entire children's ministry, so yeah, wow. it's just in us. It's in us. So, <laughs> connect the dots for me. Uh huh. From being saved and receiving Jesus Christ at, at the at the young age of thirteen mm -hmm. to moving into pastoral ship. Yeah. Tell us that story. So it's been interesting. I've been pastoring for 11 years now. It'll be 11 years in November. November 15th, we're celebrating that Sunday. Uh, getting to know Christ for me was an experience because having been raised in the church that entire time, I knew the word. I knew what God could do in your life. I understood it. I began to grow in it. So I began to go back to school and talk to other folks about the gospel. As I got into high school, uh, I started prayer at the pole. And so every morning we did that. And I started a separate Bible study as well, just to kind of do what I could do to impact lives and kind of just share with other folks what God was doing in my life. Now, here's where the story gets critical for me. Okay. Uh, sometimes when you can walk with God so deep that you forget the fact that you still need him on the level that you did when you met him. Mm. So my life shifted from me having this personal relationship to just simply wanting to share with everybody else. And it gets dangerous when you get saved and you kind of lose what God is trying to do in you to the point where you're just focusing on everybody else's issues and their needs. So that's what happened to me. So uh, throughout high school, I had these experiences. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I actually met my wife. Uh, uh, she was in the ninth grade. I was in the 11th grade. Okay. When I graduated from high school that summer of my senior year, she got pregnant. Okay. So now I, did, I knew the Lord. You know, I'm, I'm praying with everybody else. I'm right. evangelizing. But now I found myself in a place where I thought I had more strength than I had. So God really used it as a place to humble me because I went from a place to ministering the gospel to other folks, to constantly pointing out everybody else's issues. Now, here I am mm -hmm. at 19 years old thinking I'm going out of, out of state to college now, and now I'm faced with the fact that I'm about to be a father. Wow. So it was an eye-opener for me that even saved folks have to remember to remain at a place where you're teachable, where you can be humble, wow. where you're still making sure that your closets stay clean. And so I want to shout out my wife, uh, Lady Tiffany Maddox. She's watching now. And then this is a testimony that we share with people all the time is that if you're not careful, you'll lose what God is trying to do in your life, just trying to be a blessing to other folks. And so I have to continue to work on self. And that's something even as a pastor I still with, deal with. I know pastors, you know, when we sit down to, to study privately, everything ends up being a sermon. It's just like everything that you read and when you're praying, you're thinking about other people, but God is saying, make sure you keep that focus on me. And so I graduated from high school. I kind of lost myself for a minute trying to figure out exactly what I would do next, uh, what's happening in my life, because I've never been in a place before where now it's me who's in an issue now that I'm trying to operate in, where I'm trying to work out, and everybody knows. And so, so now you're looking at people saying, well, I thought he was this Bible kid, or I thought he was a Christian. And now I'm at this place where I need God like I've never needed him before. I'm questioning my future. I'm questioning my present. I'm wondering if God's hand is on my life. Can I be used again? What's happening? What's the next step for me? And so it was a very dark time in my life, just trying to figure out what was next. 
And so I thank God that I have the type of parents who spoke life into me, who supported us, who were a blessing. I never got beat down for that. It was always, okay, what's that next step? My parents started having children at a young age as well. What so a, that was a struggle. What a very powerful, powerful testimony. That's what I call a testimony. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I say that is because I can imagine how many other ministries could have been birthed mm -hmm. if they had the encouragement you had when you made your errors. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, I'm sure there's many young men and young women who who fell into you know the, that sexual trap mm -hmm. and now feel unworthy. Right. To bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this was my issue that no one tells you that just because you're called, there's no process. There's <laughs> absolutely a process. The calling doesn't mean that everything is going to line up just like it's supposed to. They spoke over my life my whole life. Uh, throughout church, pastors would just call on me and tell me that you're called in the ministry to do something amazing. I never thought, I'm one of those pastors that I said, God, I'll do anything in ministry. I know I'll be in the church the rest of my life, but I'm not pastor. <laughs> right. Because I, I see that people put on them constantly, they're calling them in the middle of the night. This is the last thing I thought I would be doing. What was crazy is that everyone around me uh, saw that. No one was surprised when it happened. And so for me, it was really a, a coming back to home thing. I thought because you were called, things would line up. Right. I didn't realize that there's a whole lot that happens between the calling and what I like to call that meantime place or that wilderness period till you get to that promised land. There's a whole lot that God has to work in and out of you to get you to that point. So, I thought you just kind of jumped into it. So at 19, mm -hmm. you're, you're dead, you're mm -hmm. becoming a dead, and you're going through the wilderness place. Yeah. How how long were you in that wilderness? So I started the church at 23. Here's what happened for me. I kind of pulled back from church altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved out into a house. Two years later, uh, she got pregnant again. We're still not married at this point. Just trying to search and figure it all out. Uh, so we finally get married. Uh, I'm sitting at Cleveland State University in the middle of a biology class. Mm -hmm. And the Lord calls me and says, this isn't where you're supposed to be in this season. Mm. It's time for you to leave. Literally, I got up at that point, walked out of the class, books and everything, came home, and uh, just began to write a vision out for what I thought was just going to be a Bible study at that point. So that we would start to share the gospel. Over the next couple of days, I realized that this was something much long, larger than a Bible study. Now, here's what, where, where it blesses me. A lot of folks get called in the church. I didn't even have the kind of relationship I thought I had with God before when God told, could pull me in and said, do this. So I come home and I tell my wife uh, that I believe God is calling us to start a ministry. Still not married. Actually, I just realized we weren't married yet when this happened. So God is pouring out vision for something in my dark place. Wow. He's showing me how to get out. Isn't and amazing? so it, it's just amazing that sometimes we wait on everything to be perfect and think we and think we just God is just going to start speaking, but that's not what happened at all. God took me in the middle of my mess, still dealing with me, and he gives me this vision for my future, something that I didn't think I would have anymore. Do you think and this is such a good this is such a good topic. Do you think that you were religious? In your younger days, absolutely. You come to me, and I would beat you to death with scripture. <laughs> I can toss it out to anybody. Right, I quote right. scripture constantly. I was more giving you God than really showing you how to have a personal relationship with Him. I never felt the way I did about God up until I fell. Wow. Our relationship was totally different after that because it took everything that I thought out of the picture. And God is saying, okay, on the surface you look right. On the surface people are seeing this, this, this stuff in you. But I see some stuff behind the scenes I want to work with. I never really allowed God to deal with me. Yeah. I was too busy praying for everybody else and quoting scripture to ever allow God to really work on me. So for me that was a humbling experience. Wow. So, so in the back of your mind, when, 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 when God started to, when you left the, the church for a minute, mm -hmm. Did you think at that point that you would come back to church? Yeah, uh, I really did. I thought it sounded like, like you were going I was, to, to I was become a doctor or something. Did you, did you want to go to I was going to be an attorney. Oh, an attorney. Yeah, okay. yeah, I just knew. I just had to take those classes to get through it, but I just right. knew I was going to be a lawyer. That was it. I was paying my bills. I was going to tithe. I was going to do everything right. right I was right. still popping in out of church. Okay. Uh, still tithing is crazy yeah. thing through all of this. Yeah. I never left them, but I left them. Gotcha. I, I realized that I needed to go deeper and instead I pulled back because everything that I thought God had for my life I thought was gone at that point so I'm just trying to figure out how to make it how to survive how to live 
And that's when I got the vision. So we started having Bible studies in our apartment. And we did this for several months. Uh, I made the decision that it was time to start the ministry. So we got married in October. We just celebrated 11 years just yesterday. Congratulations. And then, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Worst decision I ever made in my life, though, was the month after that we launched the church. Wow. The worst decision I ever made was getting married and a month later starting a ministry. When I should have been focusing on my the marriage, marriage right. everything shifted over to ministry. So now I've thrown my wife into a place where she's trying to deal with her husband. Because I don't care what yeah, anybody And she's says. unfamiliar with this. Right. Whole, right. Because she's trying not having to deal with me as a husband. There were certain things that God didn't release into our house until we got married because we weren't right. So God is trying to open doors and deal with us. We moved too fast. I was 23. She was 21. And so now we're married with two kids. And now I've thrown a ministry and a whole group of people's problems into this, trying to figure out how to make it work. And that's something I learned in that, that although God can call you and give you a vision for it, it doesn't mean move right now. Right. It's just it's always a process. Timing. Yep, it's yeah. his timing. I remember being a young man your age, and that was one of my nemesis. And one of my biggest issues is I'll get a vision, mm -hmm. and I'll move. Yeah. Didn't understand and wasn't really taught you get a vision and you wait mm -hmm. on the Lord's provision, for one, yep. and and for yourself to mature. Well, you're, you're a very, very mature pastor, very mature young man, and... You are motivated right now to help other young folks out. Mm. Is that a part of your, your ministry? I, I believe in restoration. Yes. Uh, most of my leaders, shout out to the Empowerment Church uh, yes. in East Cleveland. Uh, they're young folks, uh, many of whom never served in ministry before. Uh, we do things like our Harvest Festival. This is our third annual Harvest Festival that we have this year where we're opening up to the entire community. We've got table games and candy galore. And it's just a way to really share with the city of East Cleveland um, the love of Christ. And so it's just another ministry opportunity. But if it hadn't been for... You, see, you got to understand how your life kind of bleeds out sometimes. Remember I told you that I moved too fast. Yes. Because of that, nine years after pastoring, I had to start all over again. So when I started my church, it wasn't even called the Empowerment Church. It was okay. called Called to Conquer Ministries, which is the same ministry that I had when I was in high school Bible study. Okay. Uh, it wasn't moving like I thought it should. <laughs> okay. Everything was wrong that could have been wrong. Right. We started in the city of Euclid. Uh, we had very, very, uh, a great amount of people. God blessed it. He kept us, uh, I believe we were operating solely on grace for nine years. Yes. My wife and I are having it out because we're still trying to get to know each other. We're both in college. As we're in college, we're changing. Yeah. Uh, the church is full of young people, many of which have never served in ministry. Uh, so we just not move. We moved locations several times. Right. Uh, we were in East Cleveland three years ago, and I was ready to close it. Uh, people were coming. I just didn't feel like God was in it. I didn't feel like his hand was on it. I didn't know what was happening. Right. It wasn't just that there were two or three people coming. People were coming. People were getting saved. But I just felt like we weren't where we needed to be. To be. And so I said, okay, God, something has to change. I'm in the Shepherd's Connection under Dr. Uh, Ari Vernon here in Cleveland. Amen. And uh, he does um, a ministry conference, a pastor's conference every year. And so I told the Lord three years ago I was going to go. At the end of this conference, I was shutting my church down. This would be it. Mm -hmm. I was going to worship with these pastors. I was going to cry it out. And that was going to be it. I said, God, unless you show me something different, I'll go and serve and be somebody's usher. And the best usher they ever had wow. before I do this another year wow. and I'm not called. Because things got difficult, I began to question my calling. Like many of sure. us do, Absolutely. all of a sudden we're wondering, is God's hand on your life when things get dark? Not realizing that is still part of the process. And I'm still dealing with the fact that I moved too fast. I didn't know how to pastor, barely knew how to be a father, didn't know how to be a husband, and now I'm dealing with that all at the same time. First day of the conference, weren't there, wasn't there two hours into him preaching, and he said something that hit me so hard, I can't tell you what anything anybody else said the rest of this pastor's conference. He said, if it's not working, start over. Mm. Never had I heard that before in nine years. All I tried to do all the time was make adjustments. I'll add a little here. I'll go to hear what the pastor's doing over here. We'll try that. We'll change a flyer. We'll add an event. We'll do a revival. No one ever told me that maybe you need to start over because the foundation is jacked up. And that's like a death nail in, in, in any church. If a pastor closes, that's instant failure. So it never occurred to me to start over, to tell folks we're going to literally change everything about this ministry because the last thing you want to do as a pastor is show any kind of failure or weakness. 
It's like they'll kill you out here in the streets is how you feel. Oh, everyone's going to say, see, he was never called. I told you so. He couldn't do that. So many times in our own life, we'd rather try to cover things up mm. than just start over. Not realizing I'm adding good things to the ministry, but because the foundation was jacked up, nothing was staying up like it was supposed to. So I hit the altar that day at the end of that service and I just began to worship. And the Lord that night poured out everything for a new ministry. The name, how to restructure the staff. He changed the location. He changed how we market it. He changed how I even deal with the, the time that I spend in my family and my ministry balance. Everything changed. So I went back that Sunday, announced to the church that in the next 12 months we're going to relaunch. Instantly when I made that announcement, even before we even launched the church, Things began to happen. More people began coming. I got my energy back into the church. Ideas I never thought I would have started flowing out. And it was all because I killed it. Literally, the Lord told me it was okay That's to it. let it die. That's it. That That's many it. times we're struggling trying to give CPR to something. And God is saying, if you just let it die and let me breathe new life into it, you'll see what I can accomplish. So the Empowerment Church has only been around for three years. And God has done more in three years than he ever did in the first day. It's just blown my mind. We went from trying to find a place to stay to getting a, a brand new 32,000 square foot building for free that we're now in. Oh, we've got awesome. offices. We, we've got a, a sanctuary to see several hundred. I've got a youth sanctuary, two kitchens, classroom space for days, two parking lots. It's just been crazy what God has done. But he showed me he never would have given me any of that if I didn't first get rid of that foundation. It wasn't that he didn't call me. It was that the process was all wrong. And so that's what I say to anyone listening today, whether you're a pastor or not, sometimes God's got to kill everything, everything you started with in order to get you to a place where he can bless you but you've got to be able and be bold enough no matter what people say no matter what they think to start over I, I when I started over God started blessing us I said I don't care what people think at this point because the blessings were just coming too fast that I, I didn't even have time for the haters saying right. See, he shouldn't have closed because God literally erased it by all the work he was doing. The Harvest Festival that we're doing now, all of our, our, our events we're dealing with in terms of feeding the homeless, which we do at the last Saturday of every month, we do free breakfast. The leaders that are coming into the church, all the people that have been saved, all of the, the praise and worship leaders, and, and all of the money that God has sent the Empowerment Church to keep us stable, all that came because I killed a vision. Because I had to start over. Never be afraid of a do-over. God has given me a new level of passion for ministry. But if you had told me that it would have taken that 11 years ago now, that I would have to start and do it all fresh, I would have thought you were crazy. But God never, I never gave God the opportunity to give me the things he needed to give me to prepare me for what I was praying for. You know, it, 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 you know as, you're, as, as you're sharing with us today, I'm, I'm thinking of of. of Peter, mm. where you know he promised and, and said, "I'm going to stick with you, Lord, and I'm going to be yeah. there with you," and and then he totally reneged, just denied, yep, reneged, and and Jesus, in his infinite love for Peter, called him back, mm -hmm. sort of a do over, yeah. And it's nothing like a good do over. It's nothing like a good do over. That's nothing like a good. I'm going to give you a second chance. That's it. You know, a second chance. That is so powerful, and I, I'm, 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 I'm. I guess I'm feeling in your ministry that there are are people there that are coming who need it. They need a, a second duo. chance, and, a and that's what God. I'm seeing in every area wow. of folks' lives that maybe the vision they had or the plan they had or some things they thought were God, so they moved legitimately and honestly on faith, but He wasn't in it, or maybe not in that season. I'm seeing now God is sending people to get a second chance. My leaders are in that place where maybe they fell off or maybe they struggled in different areas in their past and now they're questioning whether or not God could bless them. So that's what we're preaching to. It, it amazes me that God will always surround people around you that are walking where you used to be. Right. And so I'm constantly bringing people out of my own wilderness experience now and seeing that, that before I could be a pastor, God had to deal with me as a man, as a father, as a husband. And that's when he blessed our ministry to be able to grow. And even today, he's still challenging me and dealing with me in certain areas now in my life. Because I used to tell my wife uh, and my kids, we're not taking a vacation until the church is right. So for years, we had two oh, kids. No. We didn't go anywhere. Oh, no. it, was, it was always about church and ministry. Church and ministry. ministry right. Now, we take vacations all the time now. Because I'm thinking that I have to arrive at a place first 
before I can pull back and relax. I've got to arrive at a place before I can take a breath. And God is now giving me joy even in the process now where I can pull back and relax. Because here's what I found out. If God's in it, he'll sustain it even while you're on vacation. Come he'll sustain on. it even when you're sick. He'll sustain it even when a couple of leaders drop off. He'll sustain it even if the money isn't there. When God is in it, his hand will stay on it. So it's okay to pull back. So now my first ministry is my marriage, is my children now. And I allow God to bless the church. Where how, before the ministry was a center of everything. How is Tiffany doing? I mean, how is she she um, doing now that you did this do-over and... Oh man, and things have changed. It's our relationship is totally different. It's stronger now than ever. We got our weekly date nights now. She's helping me pastor. She's a a a a, a one hundred percent ministry member now. Where maybe in the past it was I'd rather have my husband in all of this. So now she's in it now. Now she has a passion for it. She loves the people. But that was one of the other things I had to learn. I thought because at the time when we started, everybody had co pastors that she was mm -hmm. supposed to preach every Sunday. Mm -hmm. We're just gonna be co pastors. But she, I never gave her the opportunity to. See See where she fit in ministry now. So now she's flowing on her level now. No one's pushing her to be something that she's not. Amen. And so now I'm seeing her kind of blossom into something totally different now uh, because it was just different. When I met her in the ninth grade, there was a lot of I have an idea, let's go with that. Right, right. Right. Woman, right. That's not right. happening. Right. So I tell people when we when we got to college, one of the struggles we had was I heard no for the first time. I'm like, what do you mean no? I had never heard that before. It's like, what are you talking about? You have an opinion. It was always whatever you think is best, we'll do that. Now she's our own woman now and that's what I need now now she's poking holes in things or she's saying maybe you heard God but maybe this isn't the right thing now or I see something you don't see ah, I don't know about that person watch it wow. so now I'm able to use her as a partner now where I Absolutely. never gave her that voice before and so it's just been a blessing you're, you're very wise you're a very wise man because <laughs> the, the, the uh, Tiffany and, and, and all wives really are there to protect us mm. They want the best for us. And that's why God, I've heard it preached a million times, that's why God took Adam's rib. Mm. Because the rib protects the vital organs, the lung, and yeah. the heart, and, and those things. And, and wives are really there to be our helpmate. Because we don't see things. No. You know, mm -hmm. they, they see everything, we just see tunnelly. I'm telling you, those blind spots in that's our right. life, and that's what she's done. I can I can tell awesome. you that most of the big mistakes I've made, I've made because I didn't listen didn't to listen her. Didn't listen to the baby. I didn't allow her right. to have a voice. Right. And so I heard a lot more I told you so as I was unhappy mm. about. But had I listened in the first place, she never would have she done it. That. And so she's blocking things now. She's seeing the big vision, and she and God has opened up her eyes to see things I would never see. Because sometimes as you're running and you're just moving straight ahead, you don't see what's coming to the left or to the right. And that's what she's looking at. She's constantly got my back. Man, tell me about Harvest Fest <laughs> 2015. I see the word free. Yes, there's nothing Tell like me about it. Tell me about it. What anybody it. says free will always be my favorite <laughs> word. <laughs> so this is our third year. We made a decision being in East Cleveland that we needed to do something that was safe that provided a great outlet for kids that allowed them to have the experience in the church that would allow their parents another reason to come into the church and maybe not have to feel as nervous about being there. So three years ago, my wife and I decided we wanted to start holding a Harvest Festival. Number one, it needed to be free because in the community we're in, there's not much money. Even the city is going broke in East Cleveland. Wow. And so there's not much money for anyone to do anything. So we're saying, what can we do for our city? to allow the children and their families to come in in a safe environment, have a great time for a couple hours, get some candy, play some games, see us in a different way. So we walk around the entire Harvest Festival just hugging and loving on people and learning names and getting to know the people in the community. Because too many churches now, you drive in for Sunday or maybe Wednesday Bible study and you roll out. But we right. really believe we're supposed to be in the community. And so this is one of those ways that we can do that. So from 6 to 8 p.m., always the Monday before Halloween, we open up the doors of the church. We're playing music and games. They can stay as long as they want. Wow. We spend tons and tons of money. Our members donate money and candy and just give them as much as we can to show them that someone's thinking about them, that they love them. Some kids wear costumes, some don't. Doesn't matter. We just want them in there having a blast in a safe environment. And so we look forward to it every year. It's one of the biggest events. Over 200 kids came uh, last year. We do a masseuse for the parents so they can relax because there's kids everywhere. We do makeup sometimes. The parents can just run around, have a good time. There's punch. There's food. We try to do as much free food as we can. This year, the food bank's coming. 
Uh, we're also doing free flu shots for Walgreens is going to be there. Uh, we've got candy galore. It's just we're going to have a blast. And so that we, we pray oh, the kids have a good time. That sounds, man, that sounds like a great time in the Lord. And there's not no preaching going on. No, there. not no preaching. I ain't got to hear no preaching. If I go in there, I got to hear no, no preaching. preaching. Oh, my mouth's going to be too full of that candy. I don't, I don't have time to do it on that day. <laughs> now, now, you're located at 15837. Um, eight, where is that exactly? In, in if you know where Angela Mia Pizza is, we're the yes. Old Stone Church right next door. Everybody knows get a good slice of pizza. John John's Man, is right across the street. Pizza. And, uh, yeah, they're right next door to us, and we're in there. And uh, service is at 1.30. We do our Bible studies Tuesdays at 7 p.m. In, out by 8. But uh, the Harvest Festival will be there right next door to Angela Mia Pizza, Old Stone Church on the corner. You'll see the Empowerment Church logos on the side of the building. That's next or across the street? Which one? Uh, right next door. Yeah, right the Old Stone. In fact, okay. uh, the building that Angela Mia's Pizza in used to be owned by the church. Oh, wow. Uh, way back when it was an Episcopal Church, that's where wow. they held their Sunday, uh, Sunday school classes. So we're literally share, literally share a wall. With that ministry, Angela, yeah, man. that's the building God blessed us with. Shout out to Pastor and Lady Hannah for blessing us with that building. Uh, Antioch Christian Fellowship used to be in there. Yeah, and, uh, Pastor Hannah. Yeah, Pastor hey, Kevin, Kevin Hannah. Yeah, yeah, Pastor yeah. Kevin. I Hannah. think he got it for a dollar. He did. He got it for a dollar. Yeah, so he said there's no way he could sell the sell building. It. So he right. blessed it uh, with us. I literally walked in there, and uh, that was just a testimony in itself. My head is still spinning three years later on what God is doing. I literally still sit in that sanctuary. And can't believe that we got this building scot free. What a wonderful, it's what just a wonderful been a blessing. pastor. And I, I, I don't remember. Uh, uh, the 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 what you say it was a Episcopal, Episcopal church. church. They used to yep. come and 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 once a year they used to come and yeah. and help have services with uh, uh, Pastor Kevin Hanna. Does he yeah. do they still do that now or uh, they don't? They no, don't. Uh, every yeah. once in a while some of the members stop in stop and, in and uh, yeah, it's just a blessing. We give them a tour. They get to walk in because yeah. we're in the middle of doing renovations, right. just trying to keep the building. This was built in eighteen forty five, so yeah, it needs so a, lot, a of lot of work. work right. Yeah, but right. it's a blessing to not have that mortgage hanging over your head, so we can do things like the Harvest Festival for free. Well, my brother, I have been truly blessed. I'm sure our audience has been truly blessed by all the great things you shared. We just wish you continued. Well, I, I don't have to wish it. <laughs> Excuse me, Lord. Thank you for giving him continued success. Amen. You know, in his ministry and all that he's doing, and him and Tiffany and the children, and uh, and just real, quick, give a shout out to the PK. All right. So my PKs. kids, uh, uh -huh. Anthony, Amaya, Micaiah, and Noah, love them to death. Amen. 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 <laughs> Our babies. Hey, you're your babies. <laughs> Amen. Well, hey, Pastor, I want to just let you know we're ready to close. Okay. I love you. Jesus you. loves you. Amen. And there's nothing you can do about it. Amen. Until next time, folks. God bless you. Excellent, 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 excellent.